It's a great pleasure to welcome you all here this evening um, for our future skills debate. Um, in particular, not only a warm welcome to colleagues, students and parents, but also members of the wider Latimer community and indeed our partner schools, and we're really pleased that you're able to join us this evening. As you know, our Future Skills Initiative is all about nurturing and preparing the next generation of professionals in the workplace. Um, as technology advances and jobs evolve, it's now more important than ever to engage with how the world outside of the school gates is changing. Um, and I think you're all aware that we passionately believe um, in the importance of, for want of a better word, anti-algorithmic thinking. Um, and there's some really nice examples of that on our school website uh, under our Think Out of the Box program. Uh, and if you've not had a chance to see those videos yet, I really recommend them as sort of short, bite-sized, very, very thought-provoking and entertaining clips about innovative ways of thinking, different ways of thinking, and it seems to me that those sorts of ways of approaching problem solving are likely to future-proof our sons and daughters for, the, uh, for what is to come. Tonight, we've gathered together a panel of Europe's leading industry experts, entrepreneurs, investors, startup specialists and academics, and they're going to discuss how the pace of change will influence careers. Um, I'm particularly pleased uh, to welcome Jessica Cecil, um, who'll say a few words in a minute. Um, Jessica um, is not only a Latimer parent, but far more importantly, controller of BBC Make It Digital, um, and um, we're really, really honoured to have her chairing tonight's debate. Jessica, thank you very much indeed. Um, so the format of the evening, um, it's going to be fast-paced, because um, this is Latimer, um, and uh, there's a lot to discuss. Um, we will open up the floor to take questions from the audience at the end of the debate. Um, uh, that's probably going to be around about quarter past seven. And we've got half an hour for those questions, and we think sometimes those um, can be really, really um, uh, the most challenging and interesting parts of the evening. Um, but an important part of today is the opportunity for everyone here after the debate to network. Um, and at 7.45, you're warmly invited over to our dining room, where there's an opportunity to have some refreshment, and that's always good, um, but also to talk to people, swap ideas, um, evaluate and discuss what we've heard, and make connections, um, which is an important part of this evening. Ordinarily, um, I would be at this point asking you to turn off your mobile phones, um, but I'm not going to do that. Uh, instead, um, could you just ensure that your mobile phones are switched to silent? Because um, we do encourage you to tweet throughout the evening using the hashtag LATFS17. Um, and I should say that uh, this evening's panel debate is being live streamed via Facebook. Um, a fire alarm practice is not planned for this evening. Um, that means if a fire alarm should go off, um, please uh, follow the directions of my colleagues who will direct you out of the hall quickly and safely via our fire exits which are located at the rear of the hall and at the front of the hall. Um, I think that's all I'm going to say at this point uh, and I'm going to hand over to uh, Jessica um, who's going to say a little bit more about uh, tonight's debate. Thank you for coming and enjoy the evening. So if you are all confused about how to prepare your sons and daughters for the so-called fourth industrial revolution, for a world of work that is changed utterly by digital disruption, you're in surprisingly good company. At the World Economic Forum, Davos, masters and the odd mistress of the universe were asked this, if they were confident in advising their own children on their education to prepare them for their future careers and not a single person said that they were. Another World Economic Forum prediction from earlier this year, 65% of children entering primary school now will have jobs that do not yet exist, and crucially, for which their education will fail to prepare them. So, if the young people in the hall tonight are to have perhaps 20 jobs in their lifetime, how do we best prepare them to have fulfilling and rewarding careers over 50 years? We have a panel here of four people who are particularly well placed to make sense of that question. Ernesto. Ernesto Schmidt is making change. He's a serial entrepreneur whose ventures in media and tech are about driving the very change we are talking about. He has created numerous disruptive digital ventures, including Zbox, Beamly, PeopleSound, and most recently, Drive Tribe, with Jeremy Clarkson, Richard Hammond, and James May. 
Ernesto graduated in engineering from Cambridge and holds an MBA from INSEAD. Now, our next two guests face that disruption and are making sure it works for their companies and their industries. And that involves adaptation and change, as we will hear. Sim Skivatsa is Global Head of Retail at EF Education First. She has been instrumental in shaping many of the top names in the high street, uh, fashion as brand director for Miss Selfridge and as buying director at, at, at fashion retailers M & Co. She also knows about training diverse talents for the new world of work as a governor for the last six years of the University of Arts London. Nick Moody is head of Premier League Productions at IMG Media. His company handles production and distribution for the Premier League's international programming. Before that, he has had a distinguished career at ITV Sport and Sky. At Premier League Productions, he has driven change as digital has become more and more important to deliver Premier League matches to clients and audiences. And finally, Emma Sarone is co-founder of Freeformers, it's a for-profit, with-purpose enterprise, and it is at the forefront of thinking about, uh, in the UK, about specific attributes anyone will need to be employable, successful, and productive in the future. She and her company advise FTSE 100 companies on the skills and the attitudes they need to recruit for that future. And Freeformers has also trained thousands of young people for free in coding and other skills, which will help them get jobs. So, first of all, I'm going to throw a question to Ernesto. If you are an 11-year-old just starting today at Latimer and graduating in 10 years' time, paint a picture of the world as it will look in 10 years' time, changed by AI, by machine learning, all the things that we're learning more and more about at the moment. Thank you, that's a terrific opening question. Look, what I would say is the following, which is that since the Industrial Revolution, the sort of trajectory of um, the nature of society has been governed by economic growth, right? And economic growth for the labor force has meant only one thing, increasing, ever increasing forms of value added. So it's fairly easy to see, prior to the Industrial Revolution, you know, we were all um, farmers and traders, um, craftsmen, and with the Industrial Revolution, the value added then rose to operating machinery, with the Information Revolution and then the emergence of a service economy, increasingly had less to do with using your hands and ever more to do with using your brain. And certainly the generation that we represent here all went through education being taught that, provided you learned a specific skill, function or trade well, you could look forward to a lifetime of employment where as long as you did that well, day in, day out, you could look forward to continuing to do exactly that day in, day out. You could be a lawyer, you could be a marketer, you could be a commercial director, whatever it might be. I don't know how the current accelerating pace of the technology revolution is going to shape what roles look like other than continuing that line of value added. And with artificial intelligence and other forms of tech increasingly encroaching on the sorts of things that previously only fully trained human brains were able to do, the only prediction I can give is that the value added increases and post the current level of value added, it's not about doing something well, but about doing something new. So the main skill set in a way that I think will shape the workplace in 10, 15 years time, it's not learning a trade or a skill well, but it's learning how to think non-linearly. That's really interesting. I'm going to turn to you, Nick. OK, Nick, you have a business that is changing and changing fast. You hear what Ernesto um, says. What does that mean? Just envision in your industry, what does doing something new mean? Uh, um, I think for, for us, we, we're looking at changing the way that we distribute. Um, traditionally, we use satellites and fiber. Um, now, um, most of the broadcasters around the world that we're providing material to want this over IP. They want it um, on file delivery services, and they want a lot of material. So where we've seen great um, growth within our business um, is actually on the entry level positions. Um, which is great news for a lot of potential Latimerians that want to go into media because we need media managers um, and those are the people that probably were runners 10 years ago. So they are now coming into um, our, our business and 
they are the ones that are clipping the material, pushing it around the building, um, giving it metadata, um, and actually then going and cutting some of it and putting voice to it. Um, because it's, it's not just about the live games, it's about all the additional content, everything else that we can deliver. Um, I've just been out um, this last weekend actually in Asia at um, Singapore and Kuala Lumpur seeing how they are absorbing all the material and what's so gratifying is that we just pump all this stuff out and it's very hard to know, unlike if you're making anything for the BBC or ITV, you get to see it. We're just sending all this material out. So it's really heartwarming to be able to go out there and see all the things that um, our production teams are making, how it's all being utilised and they are using everything um, that we send out. So I suppose the answer to your question is where is it changing? It's changing, we're looking at how we distribute, that's going to be different. I think we're going to be doing a lot more over IP um, and traditional satellite um, technology is, is, is uh, going to be more redundant um, and the, just the whole growth of content as well. And does that mean that the entry level jobs you're talking about are more or less interesting for some of the young people in this room? I would say they're more interesting. Yeah. Um, and actually, we'll come on to it later on, I think, in one of the questions, is I asked the, our media managers um, what skills they felt that they could tell the, um, the, the uh, peoples of today were required. Um, and it was, it, it's fascinating that actually what they think is needed now is um, a lot of soft skills, um, teamwork, the ability to communicate, um, uh, and I think we'll, we'll come on to those a lot, a, a lot more. And there's a, a, you know, you can watch the video. That, that well, what I, what I did ask them to do is, can you tell me what the skills that you need? And actually, what they did is they made a video. So that, you know, it, that's wonderful. That's, you know, I didn't ask for that. And they went, oh well, no, we've edited it, we presented it. And I think that's there's so many opportunities for them now that um, a lot of the people that we're employing are presenting a couple of programmes, some of them's the short form content. So they can go in lots of different, different areas. Um, and I think that, you know, there's so many different opportunities. Sim, yes. um, if you look at retail, it's gone from only a few years ago being an entirely physical interaction to being, I think, something like now 60% of all retail is, is, is digital, isn't it? I mean, yes. what does that mean if you're working in your world? Well, the demise of, of stores and bricks and mortar as we know it, but the excitement of being able to purchase online, but it changes the buying model. So um, the way that now people are looking at trends is, is not through sort of agencies. It, it's more about um, people sat in offices with iPads, going through Instagram, going you know online, going through all of their pictures and seeking out the things that are coming out from that. And those are the ideas that they're taking forward. So instead of just looking at the catwalks, Burberry, and copying something now, you're looking at what you call style makers. Um, image providers, people that are just really cool and it's we need armies or the buying offices need armies of young people that have a completely online life that are able to sift through the amazing amount of images and pick out the things that are looking really, really good and taking those and turning those into high street fashion. So it's much faster than it's ever been. And, and potentially more creative as well from the sound of things. Yes, a bit, a bit looser a bit less rigid because you're looking at tastemakers from across the spectrum. You know, you don't have to be trained to be a buyer anymore, you just need a decent eye. Lots of people are able to spot really exciting things um, and then they become commercially successful. So it's opening up, I think, um, the world of fashion. It, it's really exciting. Emma, I'm going to turn to you now. And um, we've heard from three different areas about quite an interesting, fast-moving change. And Emma, you've been thinking a lot about the kind of skills and attributes people will need in order to thrive in worlds that are changing very, very fast. And when we started talking to each other, which was about two or three years ago, we were concentrating on hard coding skills, and actually it's evolved a lot since then. So tell us, what, what's the, what are the attribute sets you think we'll need? 
Um, so, as so Jessica said, um, Freeformers has uh, these two kind of uh, polar opposites, if you like, to, to what we do, which gives us a really unique insight into how people behave and, and, and the world of work. So we work with, you know, CEOs of large FTSE 100 companies. We work with people on the front line, um, as Sim said, who their jobs are changing, you know, radically right in front of our eyes to, to young people from all different backgrounds, 16 to 25 year olds. And so, and, and our insights have come from those two really different worlds, um, looking at when technology, and as you know, you've seen it in the news, you know, robots are taking over, technology will rule our life, you know, this kind of grim future, but actually it's not going to be grim, it's just going to be different. Um, and it will be different in, in a more accelerated way than it ever has been before. So you look at this, this idea of soft and hard skills, Actually, uh, you know, when you and I've, I've done quite a lot of mentoring of young people, and, and, and it's really interesting. So I'm going down this track. I'm going to be a lawyer, and I need, you know, a load of hard, you know, skills to do that. And you know, I've got to go through this particular route, and, and the world is going to be very, very different to that. So we've developed something called the Future Workforce Model, um, which is, is a simplicity, it's a set of attributes which we describe as mindset, skill sets and behaviours, and that's really, really important, all three. So rather than just learning a skill, actually what's the mindset you need in order to do that skill, to learn that skill, to want to do it, um, because if you have the right mindset, you can acquire skills on demand, you can acquire them whenever you want. We have people in the office who, on a Thursday, you say, can you help with this? And they'll come in on a Friday and say, oh, I've learned some stuff, I've looked at it online, yeah, I'll have a go. And that's what employers of the future are going to want, that flexibi flexibility and versatility. Then there are hard and soft skill sets, and there's also behaviour. What you do with it, you can learn something, but if you don't do anything with it, it's, it's not that helpful in a workforce environment. So, so that's how we think about the world in mindset, skill sets and behaviours. Um, then we've got things called um, attributes, which we put in these buckets that we have, like the tech citizen, which are largely hard skills, so things like social media, online presence, um, cyber security, coding skills, whatever that, those lists, and that will continue to, to evolve as technology evolves. Um, largely those have something called a half-life. If you learn about blockchain today, actually then if you're advising on it in three months' time, you'll be out of date. And actually, you'll be quite dangerous because you'll be you'll be doing stuff which is out of date and irrelevant. So you've got to keep build, you've got to keep acquiring knowledge and, and skill sets around those hard skills. Then there's things like communication, you know. And I think when you know certainly when I was at university, it was seen as a really soft thing. You weren't taught it. You were just either good at it or or not. And actually, you can learn this stuff. But actually, what's the mindset to be a good communicator in a world of agile working? And all corporates are moving to this thing called an agile working environment, which is will be very natural to how you all operate. But working collaboratively, using tools to share and communicate, and it might be you know people who are in 50 different countries around the world. But actually, that's a skill set. You need, you need to know which tools to use, your mindset, what are the behaviours that make you a good collaborator. That's really, really valuable in today's workforce, and it will continue to be more valuable. So there's just sets of collections of different things that we believe are valuable to make someone, to make their career sustainable. And wherever they go, small or large business, here or somewhere else, actually they can carry those attributes through, and that's what people will be employing for in the future. Ernesto, does that chime with you, given the companies you've been involved with and started? So I'd probably like to be a little bit provocative here, um, which is to say at an abstracted level, rather than thinking about kind of, you know, specific skills that might be useful today, just thinking about who's the future going to belong to. And in a very broad brush, I'd say it belongs to those who can disrupt. Those who do not know or do not stick with the status quo, but openly challenge the status quo and see solutions where others don't see solutions. And what's fascinating is that it's my belief that those who know to disrupt well fundamentally are maladjusted. <laughs> now, the reason for that is really interesting. You know, as a society, we are all conditioned from birth on to coexist in very narrow, confined spaces. I mean, 250 people here can all coexist perfectly happily because we all behave in a very, very narrow band of degrees of freedom. And what's really interesting is that all schooling does is really constrain free creativity down to narrow bands of degrees of freedom of behavior. And there's a famous experiment where if you take a preschool child and show them a paperclip and ask them for all of the applications they might come up with for the paperclip, they'll come up with like 50 crazy ideas of how you might pilot an airplane or reach the moon with a paperclip, whatever it might be. 
By the time that same child has gone through schooling, typically, as a reserved young adult, they'll come up with half a dozen. So what schooling has done is taken out the natural inborn, innate creativity that we have and reduced it down to predictable, linear, Cartesian beings. That's what we all are. And most of us like to think that we're you know, particularly clever because when the rest of the world can think from A to B, we can think from A to C, which is marginally further out, which is deeply impressive. But deeply transformative, disruptive thinking is not about thinking from A to C, it's looking under the chair or behind you where normal people simply wouldn't. So the main skill set, in a way, goes counter to what the model of education is. The main skill set is about not being afraid to challenge the status quo completely and about seeing connections and solutions where others would simply see the impossible. Fantastic. Sim, I'd like to ask you about that. You've got three hats. Your role in retail, you're a parent, and you're also a governor at the University of Arts London. And what do you make of all that? Yes, well, actually, I kind of agree with Ernesto because um, our Chancellor, the Chancellor at the University of the Arts London, is Grayson Perry, very famous cross-dresser, Turner Prize winner, um, extremely bright and campaigning. Um, and it's something he calls, he has in him, he says, in a paper written about rigour, the hobbit and the punk. The hobbit and the punk. And the hobbit is, is very sensible and straight looking and um, keeps his head down, works hard, stays within parameters. But the punk, the punk does work that's a bit messy, um, very creative, uh, very dif different. And he says that his best work has been created when both of those characters are at play. So he believes that in order to be your best self in order to come up with the most exciting, innovative ideas, um, you need to be a bit punk. And I just love that because it's just that the hobbit and then the punk. And, and our kids need the space and the time to discover their punk, to practice and to use it and to listen to that character when it speaks. So I, I, I just love that idea. Creativity is going to be one of those skills that's needed. Innovation, nothing's going to happen unless we change stuff, and, and it's our kids that are going to change stuff. But they're not going to be able to do that if we haven't allowed them to discover their passions and their creative thinking. So at EF, the company I work for, we have a program 360 degree where we take, um, you know, it's like a graduate program. Um, and the most important skill, flexibility. They've got to travel and work all around the world. But the second thing is, is creativity, problem solving. Yeah. And art, design, technology, drama, all of those things will feed into helping our kids develop those skills, which will help them answer some really tricky questions or come up with some, come up with some solutions that perhaps aren't already evident. So creativity, the ability to be able to think outside of the box. And should they be learning that at school, at home, where? Both, absolutely both, everywhere, everywhere they go. The school absolutely must provide the opportunity, but that has to happen at home. I think of a story actually where I made my daughter, I said to her, would you like to go on a coding course? And she looked at me and hissed, and I thought, mm, I've got to try this some other way. So um, I said, oh, would you like to go on a digital photography course? She loves photography. So off she went to Fire Tech Camp, um, quite happily, on her own to South Hampstead High. And um, she did this digital photography course and learned how to take better pictures, learned how to manipulate them and edit them and post them on a photographer's website where peers would actually, um, you know, rate them. Um, and she had such a good time. She apologized to me afterwards and said, actually, it was really good. And I made new friends and I learned and I want to now learn how to code. <laughs> so, you know, for girls wanting to go into technology, pick up things that they're passionate about and use that as a route to get them interested. So I think it's really important. Fantastic. Nick, what's, again, looking from your perspective, what are the skills you think will be at a premium where, and how do we instill them in young people? Well, uh I agree with everybody that, you know, we want free thinkers, we want people to come at it from a, from a different angle, but I suppose in our industry as well, we do need teamwork. Yeah. And if you are 
free thinkers, that's not always conducive to, to teamwork. I, I think also that we as parents have a, have a role to play as well. Um, we, we want to encourage free thinking, um, but I think we, we also need to encourage the type of um, skills um, from, from home. It's not just the responsibility of, of education to do that. Um, and in sort of doing a bit of research and looking into this, I mean, I, I've read a couple of things and I, I'm trying to encourage my daughter to do chores at home uh, more than she's currently doing, um, although she's not impressed with that. No, I bet. Um, it didn't go down well last night at all. <laughs> um, but I think that's really important because um, what that is doing is that it, it's, it's saying that if we all together do the, do the jobs together, then we can sit down and play a board game or watch the television or, and it's teamwork. And I think if we as parents are instilling that um, into our children, um, it leads then when they go into the workplace, they are better adjusted and, more, and um, have more abilities to be able to do that. So I think, you know, we do have roles as, as parents to play as well. We can't just ex expect the, the, the education um, establishments to come up with everything. I'm really interested by this idea of the future will belong to collaboration and free thinking because certainly most workplaces at the moment, there's a lot of hierarchy, there's a lot of land grabs. Is it really going to be so different, even if it's in the interest of the organisation, uh, to change that culture so much? Ernesto. So look, I think one of the challenges of the debate around the panel um, is that I don't think that a need for ever-increasing collaboration and a need for slightly maladjusted, free-spirited thinking are contradictory. I think it's about different roles. I think every organization, every society needs 99% of people to be administrators and needs less than 1% of people to be transformational agents. The question is, looking at you know, the parents here of the you know, wonderful academic elite that Latimer represents, whether the children here are more likely to become administrators or transformational agents or leaders. What I would say is that in the leadership capability, the main key determinant is the ability to disrupt yourself and not to be afraid of that disruption and to think in a non-linear and deeply creative way. That doesn't take away from the need for collaboration, mm. but I think the main leadership skill is not one of collaboration, the main leadership skill is one of being able to use the power of transformative ideas to, as a storyteller, galvanize an organization and galvanize an audience and galvanize consumers and customers and suppliers around new ways of working. I wanted to come back just one second ago about how is it that we teach this kind of creative, non-linear, disruptive thinking to our children. And one thing that I would encourage all parents to do is actively to encourage their children to become entrepreneurs. Now, I'm not saying leave school and you know, set up a corner store, but when I created my first venture, I was 27 years old, and at the time, everybody told me, my God, you're so young, you have no idea to run a business, how can you be an entrepreneur? The work that I do in venture capital, very often you see 17, 18 year olds with their first venture, and by 27, you'd be considered old. What you can do with your children even while they're at school, is to encourage them to say, you know, sit down one evening and write down all the things that slightly annoy you, all the things that you think are slightly inefficient, just slightly, maybe could be done differently, anything. And you can start with something obvious, like the milk goes off in the fridge or whatever else it might be, that's just slightly wrong. And assume that technology can solve any problem. And you'll find that by the end of an hour, your children will have come up with 50 ideas, each of which could be a venture. And then you can sit down with them and say, even at school age, there are ventures that you could create that don't require vast amounts of capital, but can be disruptive. And what you've done is done two things. One is you've taught them that you don't have to accept the status quo. And two, you've told them you don't need to ask permission to disrupt. You can't get a degree in disruption. Nobody's going to tell you you've now got authorization to disrupt. You simply do. And there's no reason why you can't do that with 13, 14, 15 year old. In fact, my children, um, are already on their second ventures, it's a bit crazy. But that's actually very positive because they will all grow up never accepting the status quo and never being you know, afraid of saying it can be done differently. Just 
um, there's an, an amazing organisation called Apps for Good, which does just that. So it's, it's based in schools. I don't know if you have it at this school. And, and for me, that, you've heard the story about the um, bunch of Scottish, uh, in Scotland, a bunch of, I think there were four um, lads who um, were from the farming community and had this frustration about not knowing when to, you know, sort of how do they know when to, you know, water the fields to farm, all this sort of stuff. And they were like, you know, it's crazy how our parents are doing what they're doing in a very traditional way. So they came up with an app. Um, and that was funded through there, and it was put on the App Store. There are farmers in Texas using that app. Because they identified a problem which was not UK, not Scotland, not, not their families. It was a farming problem, which actually is global. So that, for me, is a, is a brilliant example of something which annoyed them. Like why, they, why were their parents being so inefficient in terms of how they were farming and, and missing stuff that they were doing with their kids? And that was the driver. And that was real lateral thinking in solving a problem with technology that, for me, demonstrates exactly what you've just said. And, you know, they're earning money out of it, and they're, I think they're now 18. So. Fantastic. Um, I just want to turn now to what, the question of what we're expecting of young people, because it seems to me it's an awful lot. Um, it's a world of uncertainty. It's a world of constant rejection. It's a world of reinventing yourself. Um, and um, it seems to demand a degree of confidence and mental resilience that I doubt many of us had at 21. And is that really fair or realistic, Sim? Well, I don't know about fair. Um, <laughs> I think it is realistic. I had a very interesting experience this week. I had a 15-year-old um, Swedish girl doing work shadowing, work experience in, in my company. And um, I gave her a brief and I asked her to go and do some research and to come back and do a presentation. I didn't tell her what format the presentation had to take or how would she do it. I let, I let her decide. And she came back and gave, me a, a, gave us a Google Docs slideshow. Um, it, it was amazing. I, <laughs> I was quite shocked. She's, she was able to put her ideas into play. Um, she had fantastic slides and images that came and went, um, key uh, headings and her thinking. She had a beginning, a middle and an end. And it was a very, very good performance. So I think, I don't think I would have been able to have done that or that well at 15. And she was confident. She gave um, eye contact. She absolutely believed in what she was saying. And I think we mustn't underestimate our, our children and, and what they're exposed to and what they know, I think we need to give them a chance and encourage them to use the skills that I suspect they have. They, there is a, a plethora of information that they are you know, able to access far more than we ever were at that age. So I think it's using, using that um, and the ability to stand up and articulate. Being able to give a presentation is one of the most important things in the world, to be able to tell your story to a listening audience um, in a way that means something. So from that point of view, I think, yes, we, they can and they will, and we must encourage it. And it's not, Nick, it's not unrealistic expectations of resilience. N no, but I think it's also really important to give our children... Um, the permission to fail, mm. I think as long as you're trying yeah. um, and you're doing your best, you, I think it's important that we, uh, as parents, are saying it's okay to fail. Um, and so that they become used to all, uh, and rejection as well. I mean, one of the, the issues that we have within our workforce is that half the workforce um, is on fixed term contracts. So every summer we're turning around to 75 people and saying thank you very much for all the efforts that you've put in over the last 10 and a half months. Um, you've done a great job, um, but we don't require you for the next two months because there's no football. Mm. Um, and that's rejection. Mm. Now, some of them embrace it and go travelling for six weeks and have a wonderful time. Some of them go and work on World Cups or European Championships or Wimbledon or some of the other events that IMG have. And others are, oh my God, how am I going to pay my mortgage? So you need resilience and you need to be able to... And it's, you know, I think it's up to us as, as, as parents to help them 
um, uh, have that resilience and give them permission to fail. I think it's really interesting, and I think that the great technology companies in Silicon Valley in many ways help here. Um, you know, it doesn't matter whether you work at Facebook, Google, or any of them, there is no failing, there's only learning. And that's the key mindset. You know, Mark Zuckerberg in the, you know, coding rooms where the software engineers sit and do their work has written in big bold print, move fast and break things. That's what the motto is, move fast and break things. And in that sense, he's giving permission for agility and innovation, and he accepts that it's more important to recover from mistakes swiftly and learn from them than it is to try to avoid mistakes. And that gives an incredible sense of freedom and power to the teams because they're not afraid of making mistakes, it's just learning. You make a catastrophic mistake, great. We now know that we don't have to go down that route anymore. Brilliant, we can take that out of our mental focus and out of our resource focus and redeploy it over there. And I think what we need to do is help our children in exactly the same way. There is no failure, there's learning, and out of learning comes growth. Fantastic. So, before we go to the floor um, for questions, can each of you, Emma, starting with you, give us one tangible takeaway? I think, just to say, the, the fact that you're all here, the fact that you care about your children's education and they're at a school where this debate is put on is a real reason to be optimistic. But what are the tangible takeaways, the, the piece of advice that you'd give in one sentence? Um, it is to find something you're really passionate about, a big problem you want to solve, something you like doing, because if you have this, this thing that's hanging there, and you, you, you find different ways in your career or your entrepreneurial suits to get there and, and, and do something because you're passionate about it or solve this bigger problem. That's its drive. And I think in an environment that's changing all the time, there's lots of different routes you can go down. For a young person to find their passion, I think is, is an incredibly value, valuable piece of advice because I don't think a lot of people stand still, have their headspace to actually go, what am I really passionate about? What do, what do I really, really want to do in life? What do I really want my life to be about? And then actually everything else follows from that. And I think, and also everyone in this room, who you know, you're at this amazing school, how you help other people that you come across in your life to also find that passion. And I think that's the most valuable thing that we can all do. Fantastic. Ernesto. For me, it's uh, really encouraging your children always to nurture forever a small corner of craziness in their mm. heart. Because I think craziness, really craziness, becomes the source of confidence, courage, and creativity. And as long as you're happy to be a little crazy, and as long as you encourage your children to be a little bit crazy, and not to be apologetic about it, that's a fantastic fertile breeding ground. Fantastic. Sim. So I'd like to say to the, to the kids to keep asking the question, why? Why are we doing it this way? Why, why are we still doing it this way? What, what difference does it make? Why? Question, question, question. And ask and encourage your teachers and your parents to teach you things that aren't on the curriculum. Yeah, things, things that just aren't on the list of required knowledge. Um, and you need to give them permission to, to go off piste and, and to tell you about those things. And I think um, that's really important for the kids. It, it's a, it's a two-way thing. You have to demand to understand why. Nick. Control your own destiny. Mm. Um, be resilient. Be brave. Uh, be determined. Uh, take risks. Um, don't take no for an answer and f find a career that you enjoy. I think that's, yeah. you know, I've been very lucky to find something that is a passion, um, uh, but also be realistic that um, no job is good every day of the week, mm. and you're gonna have some bad days as well. Fantastic. I'd like to open it up to questions, but particularly from young people, because I want, we're talking about your future, and we'd really like to hear your thoughts about it and whether what everybody here has been describing sounds realistic as far as you're concerned. So there are a couple of mics, I think. Um, are there any questions? Hi. Um, Stephen Hawking did an interview with the Times in June this year explaining like, the threats of AI and how, if not handled correctly, it could be a massive threat to all the working world, even, even affecting like, Darwinism within our genes. 
Um, how do you think fast-paced technology such as AI is going to affect us in the future, in the next 30, 40, 50 years? There will come a point when Skynet becomes self-aware. <laughs> You can tell the difference in age. Those who watch The Terminator, there you go. Um, but by the way, this is a very interesting... Uh, very quickly go off piste here. So the human brain's got 100 billion neural connections, right? Well, there are already 30 billion internet-connected devices, and there's a big debate, which is at what point will the internet become self-aware? And even more interestingly, how will we know if it's become self-aware? Because you definitely have sufficient neural connections between connected internet devices is that you're mirroring the complexity in your own brain. Now, in the Terminator, in that dystopian future vision, Skynet becomes self-aware and destroys humanity because they decide that humans are completely useless and the machines should take over and they are the brave revolutionaries who try to fight against the machines. I don't share that dystopian view of the future. I think we'll be just fine. What I do think, though, in answer to your question, and it comes back to the very first question, the opening one of the, of the session, happiness will accrue not to those who do things well in a traditional way, but to those who thrive on jumping around and being non-linear and being disruptive, including to themselves. Um, and that, you know, in, in every single step of um, evolution since the Industrial Revolution has left behind losers and created new winners. But it's also inevitable. So in the UK, when the textile mills were replaced by, you know, cheaper textile mills in Asia, you created a lot of unemployment. But it also means that the economy in the UK as a whole moved to a high level of value added and would have been nonsensical to try to maintain pottery and textile manual labor um, in what are high value added, um, highly educated economies such as the UK. So there will be losers in this, but I think the winners in this entire process will be those who can be the highest level of value added, either creators. Emma, um, dystopian or utopian vision of AI, are machines, machine learning, computers going to be our servants or our masters? So I think we have to get really uncomfortable with the un we have to get comfortable with the unknown because actually none of us know nobody really knows what's going to happen. I'm really positive because I think humans have a brilliant um, history of reinvention. We're just going to have to do it much more quickly than ever before. Um, so this idea of being really curious um, and really disruptive and reinvention is going to be really, really critical. And we work with a lot of you know, people in large corporates and, and actually they're just not really they're not set up to do that because they've led this very linear path. Um, and actually you all have a huge opportunity to be that generation that are going to make sure that you live with AI rather than instead of. But no one really knows. It's, we've got to just be super, super comfortable with never really knowing what the future holds, just be comfortable with disrupting it and making ourselves useful. I think maybe some of the, the jobs that are um, repetitive and routine, um, those are the ones that are probably going to be in, 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 most, in most danger. Um, Singapore are just op opening a terminal at their airport where they are striving to not have any humans in the terminal, that you will go through it and not see a, a, a human being. Um, when, you, when you go to check in, it will be automated. You'll have a retina scan for security reasons. Then when you go to security, it will be another retina scan. So those people that are doing those jobs, which are routine and repetitive, maybe those jobs are in danger. And therefore, we're just going to have to look at doing different types of jobs. So it's, it's, we need to adapt. Um, and I'm not sure I'm ready to go through Terminal 4 at Singapore just yet. <laughs> and Sim, do you have a view on, very good question, whether AI is going towards a dystopian or a utopian future? I think utopian. I think I think it'll be about us learning how to work with um, AI and and technology better. And I read a book recently about the future of education, and it was talking about how technology would become the teaching assistants in classrooms to allow the teachers, so they wouldn't take over. We wouldn't not need teachers. In fact, we'd need teachers doing the job that actually they should be doing, which is educating the child all around holistically, um, coaching and mentoring. And it would be the technology that real time, live time, would be able to track the student's progress and feedback and give a bespoke 
feedback service on what that individual child was learning and at what rate. I find that quite exciting. So the teacher's there as a coach, um, in a way, managing that child's development. That's, to me, a really exciting example of how AI becomes a friend and, and uh, an enabler. And just, just one more. I, my actually concern about machine learning AI is actually the point of bias. Yeah. So actually, is if you put lots of data in something that's biased, then it will turn out stuff that's biased. And that's, I think, the thing that, that you know, us and your generation will really have to be um, custodians of to make sure actually society gets more equal as much as it can do, rather than actually separating more than it is. We've seen it, you know, everything that's going on with politics and uh, what's going on around the world. So that's the real danger with AI. But I think as humans, we can be the custodians of that and make sure that doesn't happen. Yeah, and the unsupervised nature of machine learning with the assumptions being put in now with, with outcomes coming sometime in the future. Brilliant. Anyone, any other one at the front? Um, so as time goes on, the world's becoming more non insular and I don't think we've really talked about the importance of um, international skills, so language skills, um, cross-culture exposure, so how important will that be, say, in 10 years, especially post Brexit? Um, Vital. I work in a company that has offices all around the world, 47,000 employees, and the graduates that come are expected to travel around to those different offices and live in those different countries. So you might be in Shanghai one day um, and five months later in Dubai. Um, the ability to be able to cross continents, oceans, and work well within teams that perhaps whose English isn't their first language is going to be absolutely vital. Um, part of that would be speaking the language, which would be a bonus. Um, but I remember being at a millennial 2020 conference with lots of tech companies. Um, and I remember we work and I think transfer-wise, talking about actually lots of their meetings are held on Skype or on video conference um, it, it, with all sorts of countries phoning in. So the ability to be able to work across continents is going to be absolutely vital. So actually it's about adaptability as opposed to necessarily language skills. Yes, yes. You, you won't be sort of punished if, if you can't speak the language. It would be an added bonus. Um, but the ability to work with different cultures is going to be vital. So again, it's about mindset. Ernesto? I, I'm going to be contrarian here. In the 25 years of my professional life, I would argue that the world has become dramatically more homogeneous rather than heterogeneous. When I started working, you went to Germany, nobody spoke English. You know, you, you went to Eastern Europe, it was a completely different world. Whereas nowadays you go to a tiny town in China and they've got exactly the same shops there as you have, you know, walking down the high street over here. Language is becoming irrelevant. When Google Translate becomes your best friend and I can make myself perfectly understood walking through Tokyo, just, you know, talking to my phone in English and it comes out in Japanese the other end. So look, I mean, I think definitely the world has become more global and work is more global. But I'm not sure that with that globalization, um, you know, you've seen the divisions between cultures be as marked as they were before. And in fact, the global nature and the global monopolistic nature of media means that we're all becoming much more homogeneous um, rather than really maintaining the heterogeneous nature that we were previously. Which makes mm. being different and creativity all the more important. Or I just say that, you know, the things that were fantastic previously, gosh, you speak four languages, that's incredible. I, I don't yeah. know whether that's going to be relevant in the future anymore. My brother is a live simultaneous translator. You know, five years ago he said he would go to his grave before he could be replaced by a machine. I'm not so sure anymore that in five years' time he's still got a job. Yeah, yeah so I, d I don't think it's about language, it's about cultural references. Mm -hmm. So I go to small, small, small towns in China, you know, and, and there are some small towns in China, believe it or not, and you would need to understand where you are and what sort of things work culturally. It's really important still to, to be appreciative of other cultures. You know, despite Google Translate and all of that sort of thing, you know, people are extremely different and business practices in different countries are extremely different. So learning about those, even if you don't have to use them and being aware, will get you further in your negotiations with those people, if you can look at it from their point of view. So that is emotional intelligence, putting yourself in their place culturally and um, obviously individually as well. So it's still important. Fantastic. 
Nick? No, well, I mean, it's social skills, isn't yeah. it? And that's what computers don't necessarily have, so... Not um, yet. Yeah, not yet. That's where we have the advantage. OK, can I move on to another? Any other questions? Oh, uh, there's, actually, there's a student here. Um, if, if the pace of change is getting faster and faster, do you think that there's kind of any point in, for example, like studying for seven years to become a lawyer? So I suppose those kind of hard skills that we were talking about are those going to still be necessary? Emma, so I think it will change because actually being a lawyer now is, is working with AI and so things that are really repetitive. Why would you need to... Uh, my niece actually came for work experience over the summer and she wrote a great blog piece and she used the legal profession as one of her examples. So why would you need to remember or even know which book to go and look at different parts of the law when it's all stored in a you know, big knowledge of a bit of software? Actually, what you need to do is do the really human bit of analysing that data and be able to reference it to the particular case that you're working on. Um, so things like, uh, um, like being a... Um, so there's a big legal uh, department of a very large company, it's about 50,000 people. And actually what they've done is put AI in. And actually now they're recruiting lawyers who, who have a good sense of legal references. But actually people are just really good with people interactions who are good at solving problems. Because actually they're just really good problem solvers now who can use then a point of reference in AI to get the right information out. So I think it's all about how, as a lawyer, how you work with technology to actually provide the best answer to the person you're working with rather than knowing the law end to end. And I think that's the same with accountancy, any profession. So, Sim, the implication of, behind that question is, are uh, higher education dealing with that challenge well enough or are they still teaching you what to be a lawyer in the way they did 20 years ago? I can't speak for other universities, I can speak for the University of the Arts London, who are equipping their students, our students, with the ability to work with the unknown. So art is all about ambiguity. You know, it, 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 you have to experiment and make mistakes and take risks to get to the answer be that in IT or fine art or whatever that is. So at the UAL, it is creativity. And what we're seeing is actually that creative element of their education will future-proof them. So, um, you know, contrary to schools stopping art and, and sort of music and all of those sorts of things, that's good, that's vital. That's vital for our, for our kids to understand how to be able to problem solve in a creative way. Take risks and experiment, experiment, experiment. Fantastic, can we take another question? Any other questions? Oh, there's a lady up yeah. front here. Oh, is there, oh, right, sorry. Um, I was just wondering, you all talk about technology now, as we know, So, Ernesto, have we sort of missed? <laughs> well, have we missed the big issue? So, one of the key characteristics of human nature is that we believe in this kind of you know linear incremental model. So, I always love looking at forecasts because they always are taking the most recent trend and just broadly, linearly projecting it forward. And that's, of course, not how the world works. The world works in black swans. So, you know, we currently see on the horizon the big threat of climate change, and it's a very big issue. And depending how the political winds and the political climate goes, either we're working towards a solution or further away from a solution. But I don't even know whether that's the fundamental issue. I suspect that there's going to be one or more black swans that are going to come out of nowhere. Will you just explain and what a black swan is? For people oh, who don't so, know. so up until... A hundred years ago, people thought that black swans didn't exist. And then somebody first found a black swan in New Zealand somewhere. And all of a sudden you realize that actually black swans do exist. So in this context, a black swan is a completely unexpected event. Yeah. So the world doesn't move in a linear way. It happens in a step change. The internet was a black swan, right? I mean, the internet has completely changed the way that we um, exist on this world. And nobody could have foreseen it in 1992 that 10 years later the world would have changed. Fantastic. Nick? Global change, um, well, we need some free thinkers to come up with some solutions for it, don't we? Yeah. So um, I'll throw it back to you. You know, you're the future. Come up with some ideas 
to try and stop the, uh, the, the, um, the, the erosion. Um, I mean, when I was looking up some, some jobs, jobs for the future, um, uh, a, a rewilder was, was one of them. Um, someone that can, can go back and take um, urban uh, landscape and make it wild again. And that's probably what we need. It's that type of free thinking, isn't it? Yeah, I, this goes back to finding a purpose. It sounds like you, you found your purpose, and I think that's really to, to build a career and a community and actually solve it every day in the incremental, but also create a community around you that you can think big. And I think technology will be the answer to some of that. Um, and you need to harness technology to solve some of those big problems. But I think, you know, we found some in the room that's got a, a big purpose, and that's amazing. Fantastic. Other questions? So my question is to Ernesto. We talked about destructive technology, and uh, top of my head, I can think of three or four names of destructive technology. There's Amazon and Facebook, transfer-wise, maybe Credit Karma. None of these destructive technologies were spearheaded by a woman. Do you see in the future women spearheading destructive technology? And if that is going to happen, how do schools like Latimer encourage more and more women to go into technology and finance and, and, and these kind of courses where they will you know, change the way we, the world moves? Yeah, that's really an outstanding, outstanding point, an outstanding question. I mean, I would point in certainly Facebook's case to Sheryl Sandberg, who's played as important a role as Mark Zuckerberg in turning that into, you know, the spectacular monopoly that it now is. But more importantly, I would say the first wave of technology was driven primarily by product-driven organizations. All of those companies that you mentioned, as founders, had engineers and product people. That's very interesting, right? No great Silicon Valley tech company started out being a sales and marketing driven organization. They all started out being product organizations. And therein lies the problem, which is that if you go and if you went 10, 20 years ago um, into class at Stanford, into a computer science class, it's 100% men. And they tend to be, you know, not of necessarily highly exacting standards of personal hygiene and social skills and all the rest. And I wouldn't say it was an altogether welcoming environment for women. But this is fundamentally the challenge, right? I mean, I studied mechanical engineering, manufacturing engineering, and there were 10% women in my class in Cambridge. It's even worse in computer science. So the fundamental problem is that as long as you've got these businesses that come out of product organizations, you've got a skills gap in that not sufficient women are becoming software engineers. And I think what we can do is encourage you know, our daughters to think of software engineering as the art to make anything possible. I mean, I have to say, for me, I studied engineering, and as I was telling the panelists early in the green room, all of my tutors agreed that I was a useless pupil of engineering um, because I didn't get engineering. I now get engineering. When I go into a room with my engineering team, and I paint a crazy idea, and I say, wouldn't it be amazing if we could do X? And it's crazy. But those guys and girls don't shake their head and say, what are you talking about? They think like, oh, how could we do this? How could... And they make the impossible possible. And that is invigorating. It's electrifying. I mean, there can't be anything more magnificent than creating something out of an idea. And if that's how we teach what engineering is to our daughters, I think you're going to find 50-50, because by and large, I see no reason why girls should be any less electrified by the transformative power of an idea than boys. Emma. It, it, it comes down to, I don't have children myself, but I have lots of nieces and nephews, and it, it really astounds me. So one of my nieces is amazing at maths. She, nothing excites her more than going out with her friends, but also maths. But even though she had the chance to do three technology subjects at school, she didn't do any of them because she didn't see the link. And that, for me, is heartbreaking. And she's also really good at art, by the way. So she's really creative, she's really good at math. And you go, wow, imagine being put technology in that. She'd be an amazing, you know, part of that ecosystem. And that, for me, is um, it's different at this school, I'm sure, but in education generally, we're not making the link for people. And if people duck out of that age, we've lost them. We've lost young women. And I think that's where we really, really need to focus this. Very briefly, I'm going to hold my hand up and say I'm German for the purpose of this question, because I think that we also have a cultural issue in the UK, full stop. Now, now bear with me, this is my bugbear. So in Germany, if you study engineering, you're held in the highest regard. In the UK, 
the guy who comes to fix your toilet or the photocopier is referred to as an engineer. I remembered when I got to Cambridge and I was young and German and had a strong accent, which I've lost since. <laughs> you know, all of those who weren't studying engineering were making fun of me saying, oh, oh, you're going to fix the bathrooms, are you? Oh, you, you can fix the plumbing. Because culturally, what kind of aspiration are we giving our children if we're referring to what are low levels of value added with exactly the same moniker as those who change the world? And that's why I, whenever I see anyone in an office, somebody's written photocopy broken, engineer on call, I take out my Sharpie, I cross it out and I write technician, because that's the difference. Technicians fix things, engineers create things. Okay, Sim, the um, <laughs> statistics are pretty dire, as you know. Computer science, less than 20% of uh, people who take it at GCSE, at A-level, into university are women. W what are we going to do about it? It's difficult. It's the language around um, the subject is difficult. Uh, it, it, it's not attractive to yeah. women. It's not attractive enough. And as, as you say, the links aren't made. So you don't know what you can do. Um, I think some of the most fantastic engineers are, are polymaths. You know, that they've a lot of engineers, if you study the best, sort of the most successful engineers, they've studied a lot of art. They, they, they've done art at ASA level. Creative thinking. Okay. Creative thinking. Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, an artist and a creator and innovator. Uh, I think at the end of the day, we've got to find a way of maybe breaking down the subject matters in schools. Because if you just say to girls, computer science, they just think of geeky blokes, geeky boys. Uh, and it's just an off-putting, old-fashioned way of thinking about computer science. It's wrong, but we're not giving a different language to the girls to enable them to make the decision to investigate. It's back to my example about, you know, digital photography or coding. Yeah, really. You know, it, at the end of the day, it's got to be something a, a woman wants to do and loves. And then technology is the enabler to help you scale and get your idea, you know, marketed and, and fully functional. So, you know, it's not the tech itself. It's the, using tech as a facilitator, as an enabler. And that's what will turn girls on, I think. So it's purpose versus process. Yeah. yeah. Any other thoughts? I've got the mic back here. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, I have mic. Okay. So the, the new scientist this week writes, um, interestingly but rather ambiguously, about uh, young people faced with grim working work prospects turning to each other rather than the patriarchy in the conventional sense for opportunity. And I know that school teaches, whenever teaches um, uh, the students how to promote themselves using um, uh, social media, etc. But does the panel, or perhaps students in the audience, have any ideas about how to use the kind of technology that Sim just talked about to promote each other, to help each other, to find opportunity, to create opportunity, perhaps in ventures or in any, in any other way? That's interesting. So Nick, peer-to-peer -peer support, Lots of people talk about it. Is it something you see? Well, I, yeah, I think it's what I was referring yeah. to at the, at, the, at the beginning of the evening, really. Yeah. When I turn around to our uh, media managers and say, what skills do you think are required for your job? As a group, they put a video together. Yeah. They filmed it. They edited it. Um, they presented it. Um, they then went and put subtitles on it because James asked me to put subtitles on it and, we, and they went and did that. So that was initiative. They, um, they did that all on their own. They didn't, there was no cameraman, there was no editor. So all those skills are things that they've taken on and, and um, are nurturing themselves and doing it as part of a team. So yes, we need disruptors, but um, we also need people that, that, that can work together and, and they, you know, they've done that as a group. And Emma, the Freeformers um, alumni, again, is that a peer-to-peer -peer supportive group? Yeah, so community is everything, and I mean that in a very, very broadly sense, because um, it is the thing that, you know, so, so we have a couple of people, young people in our office, and, and one said to me the other day, she's, uh, she's 22, she <coughs> looks after all of our, she's one of our data team, and her told, oh, her have sent someone to automate myself, so how can I do the output of 10 people? How can I automate this job? But then she said to me, all of my f uh, really, really close friends, are friends that I've made in the gaming world, I said, what do you mean? She went, well, they're in six different countries, um, and they're my support group. 
Should I trust them? I've validated them. I've now known them for three years. Um, and they're my support group. Now, it doesn't have to be in the gaming world. I'm not saying all we'll go off and play games and hook up with people you don't know who they are. I'm saying this sense of online community can be really negative, but actually can be really powerful. Now, I have other people who have come to us from Canada, and she has friends, in, I think, in 12 countries, all through online communities where they've looked at common interests. And I think that's a, a really positive thing. In a, in a local community, in a global community, whatever. Actually, how do you use that as a support network, as a learning network, as a network to elevate an idea that you have? And I think that it, this isn't going to be new to any of the young people in this room. It's what you do. And that will become more and more valuable in a workplace environment where you're able to think like that and grow ideas in those communities. Um, it's pretty alien to anyone um, older than that, I think. I think there's time for one more question. Yeah, question back. Okay, fantastic. Can you envisage a system where we are not just examining the subjects, but also the skills you say are important? Interesting. Interesting. Sim. So where we're examined on skills as opposed to subjects. Is that right? I th yes, well, I think we're all waiting for that, but that, that'll be down to the policy makers. Um, there are huge debates uh, about the role of education, exams versus, you know, um, assessing children on other skills as well. Forward-thinking schools have created environments where that is happening, where you are rated um, against extracurricular activity, your engagement, how many books you read, not just by the exam results you gain. So there, I believe there will be change, but it's going to be a long time coming. And, and schools are in a very difficult position at the moment with doing, you know, they are slaves to exam results. And, and that's been set up. Um, by, by the policy makers and the government. And I don't know when that's going to change, but I do know that um, good and forward-thinking schools and heads constantly fighting and finding room to allow the kids to be measured um, uh, 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 as successful against other criteria. Ernesto. Well, I mean, what I would say is this. Um, the model of education that we have is centuries old now and really served its purpose kind of during the Industrial Revolution to do very basic triaging according to skills. I think that there is a hugely rich vein of innovation that's going to come in ed tech, education technology. And I look forward with incontinent excitement to new forms of education that will be technology assisted and enabled and interactive and non-linear that will really put completely to shame the way that we teach currently. What's interesting though is one of the reasons why ed tech is slow to take up is not for lack of innovation, but you have very poor customers. You've got cash poor local you know, councils and, and communities and local governments who are the ones who um, um, you know, disperse the funds around education and they are loath to innovation. So the reason why EdTech hasn't advanced more rapidly in a broad scale is because governments are really bad at innovation. And it's the most innovative private schools that are kind of powering ahead on that. Um, but I think education will be unrecognizable in 20, 25 years from what it's now. Fantastic. On that note, uh, well, um, I think on our behalf, I'd really like to uh, thank uh, Jessica and our panel for a really stimulating discussion. Um, I think I'm right in saying that today is the anniversary of the Nobel Prize that was awarded to Albert Einstein, who famously said that we won't solve the problems of today with the same kind of thinking that created them in the first place. And we've heard this evening about the importance of non-linear thinking uh, agility, flexibility, innovation, soft skills, collaboration, um, none of which you can do A-levels and GCSEs in. And, and I wholeheartedly endorse what the panel have been saying about the importance of thinking about soft skills, dispositions, habits, ways of thinking. Uh, and the great news is those are all encapsulated um, in our education strategy with our habits of heart, hand and head, the Latimer Learner Profile. Um, so we find that very, very reassuring. Um, so, on our behalf, uh, my first really important task is to thank Jessica, Nick, Sim, Ernesto and Emma. Thank you very much. <laughs>